Windows 7, Windows 8, and uh, Windows 10 come with built-in backup utilities. I call native backup utilities for backing up both files as well as systems. And it's pretty good. If, uh, if you have no backup software, you can use the built-in uh, Windows backup tools to backup and restore in an emergency. It's very helpful to learn and understand those environments. So I put these videos together for myself in learning these backup uh, tools, as well as for my customers in situations uh, where I am uh, assisting customers. Sometimes their computers are working fine. I can remote in with TeamViewer and give them a hand. But in the situation where uh, I can't remote in, they have to be left to their own to try to recover from any kind of scenario. It's kind of helpful to have videos proactively made. And this has been quite a work in progress because it spans three different operating systems and uh, there's a unique way of doing things in each of them. So I have gone through the process of uh, creating, as you saw, three uh, multiple different operating system variants here. Here's a Windows 7 professional, although it's been retired now. Now it's being um, April 2020. There still is plenty of this out there and you might uh, encounter it. Um, uh, Windows 8 is still supported for a little while yet and um, so I'll be getting some calls on this and so I've included the Windows 8 uh, backup restore process as well. And then lastly, Windows 10 is quite uh, quite modern and, and still out there in large numbers. So I've included information related to that. So I'll go over the environment that these videos are created in, the virtualization environment, some, some homework related to uh, some terminology before we jump into the individual operating system parameters for backup and restore next. Let's talk a little bit about navigating these videos. This video here is a, a previously made example related to OneDrive. It's not relevant to doing backups right now, but I'm just using this as an example. I prefer to make videos in small chunks, breaking them up into chapters. It makes production much easier and um, it also is more digestible for people. And unfortunately, Google or uh, YouTube does not support any kind of chapter flipping uh, native to the client. However, what they do honor is, and what I take advantage of is I go down to the description and I carefully document um, where the timestamps are for the beginning of each chapter. And then by simply putting the number here manually, Google will actually, uh, YouTube will actually honor the links to these timestamps and interestingly will we'll change the the relative link. I'll show you what I mean. I'm just going to click on configuration and it moves over to the beginning of that chapter. If I wanted to go to moving your folders, I just click that link and, and it moves to that relevant chapter. That's going to be very helpful in these uh, Windows 7 native backup uh, videos because there's a lot of different chapters, a lot of different uh, areas where you could get lost if you were trying to watch it um, as one big gigantic um, video which would just be a mess. So hopefully this will help you navigate around in the videos as you go. These videos were made uh, using virtualization software. Uh, there's a wiki entry here that describes what that is. Uh, they're platform virtualization software thought of as an emulator, hypervisor, or and software package packages that emulate the whole physical computer, often providing multiple virtual machines on one physical platform. So think of it as having one computer that is hosting a bunch of other smaller computers or even identical computers. I'll show you a little more detail about it, but virtualization has taken over 
uh, the world for quite a few years now. There's so many different types of virtualizations, software tools all over the world right now. In fact, a lot of the machines that you touch and interact with on the internet are chances are very good that it's a virtual machine. Now, uh, one company that got way ahead of the curve uh, in terms of virtualization of uh, desktop computers is VMware. Um, I became addicted to using VMware Workstation Pro and I, I can't go back. They do have a free version if you're interested in trying it out. It's called VMware Workstation Player and it's exceptional. Now, um, you may need to consider some kind of hardware. The computer that it runs on uh, is going to be, the, the virtual machines that you create are going to be divided up and using some of the resources of your computer. So obviously you need some kind of resources. Let me minimize this. The computer that we're running all of these VMs on for these video series, it's a five-year-old Z book. I don't know what version, but uh, it, it has a, a fairly advanced for the time uh, multi-core CPU. It has four cores inside of the CPU. It has a really high frequency rate. So it's a pretty high-end CPU. You don't need, necessarily need to have a monster CPU. Even though this thing's five years old, you can still run it on some modern five-year-old or, or newer CPU that doesn't have to be multi-core. What's really important is the amount of RAM. Um, and this machine has 16 gigs, which is not a huge amount compared to these days. But you can easily get away with running at least one machine, even if you have only four gigs of RAM. It might be a little slow, but it's still going to run. Now the software itself looks kind of like this. Um, here's the here's the software. You'll see me poking around with it as we're as we're going through these videos. And I I currently have a Windows 8 machine running here. I have a Windows 10 machine and another Windows 10 machine running away. And the cool thing is is that um, the, you just build a computer just like you would with a traditional computer. You you go through an interface and you add hardware and it's all clicking. You simply, once the machine is built, you, you tell the machine to boot from media. So it's identical from building a real physical machine. It's just all done with software. And under the hood, um, your virtual machines are just uh, files that live within a directory. So let's see, here's a, a machine I've made for a OneDrive testing. And it's just a bunch of files. You'll see here that there's a, a 10 gigabyte file, which is the operating system disk. And there's another file here, which is uh, currently 80 megabytes, which is a backup disk. And all these other files, they, that is what actually makes up the computer. Now, the advantage of doing stuff with VMware is astonishing. I will be able to uh, quickly create a machine much faster than I could if I had traditional old school hardware. And I could utilize uh, a, a backup feature that's called snapshots. And with snapshots, I can create a, a, a state of the machine in real time, super duper quick, and then do whatever I want to the machine, torture it all I want with polluted software and playing around, and, and I can just simply go back to my old snapshot within seconds. I can't do that with physical hardware. I have to restore with traditional tools, which does take periods of time, like 30 minutes to an hour to do traditional restores. With snapshots, it's, uh, it's literally seconds. So there's huge advantages to doing uh, all of this stuff in VMware and poke around with it if, with yourself if you want to learn machines or learn alternative operating systems. It's, it's, uh, it's really the way to go. Before we go too much further, let's get some words out of the way. Um, let's talk about what, what are files, what are folders, what are directories, and what are libraries. Um, obviously, files is the simplest concept. Files are the things that we, we create and work with every day, like these. And uh, in the Windows world, we use the word, word folder, and folders contain files. Um, if you come in from uh, the Macintosh or Unix or Linux world, sometimes we also use the word directory. So directory and folder are identical words, identical concepts. So this is 
this Smart Notebook Interactive Viewer is a folder or it is a directory. These are files. Now, there's another concept that uh, Microsoft introduced with Windows a uh, few versions back called libraries. Libraries are a special form of a uh, folder that contains your, your, your stuff. And sometimes they can get confusing uh, when you're looking at them. Let's look at it from a top view. I'm looking here at my operating system drive. I'll back up a bit. I'm looking here at my operating system drive, my C drive. And then I go to the users directory. And here is my name, Steve. This could be considered your home directory. And in my home directory, I've got a bunch of objects here. These are technically libraries. If I was to right click on these objects, let's say on the documents object and go to properties, I'll see a special sort of reference here to location. And then I could specify where this special folder, well, really, it's really a, a library, where it lives. It lives in Users Steve Documents. Okay, so it's also the documents is not only a name of a library, it's also the name of a directory, which is a little bit confusing sometimes. If I was to open up this documents folder or directory, you'll see that that is in fact where it lives. User Steve Documents is a folder or a directory, and it's also a library. So don't let that get too confusing. Luckily in Windows 10, as well as in Windows 8, the name of your documents library is also the name of your documents uh, directory. I'll go to Steve here on this Windows 8 machine. Here's documents. Double click it and it's called Users Steve Documents. So that makes sense. Now on Windows 7, you may not see this. It may have driven you crazy a long time ago, but um, under Windows 7, they actually identify the library with the word library, which is a little more helpful. And they have these important things, your documents, music, pictures, and videos, libraries. And under the documents library, there's this My Documents, which is uh, no longer use. I don't see the word My Documents anymore. If I look at it from above, I'll go to My Documents. As you see, it's called, this library is called My Documents. And if I come up here and look for the path, it's actually hotwired to a folder called Documents. Luckily, we're not using Windows 7 anymore, and this little confusing thing is not going to bite you as much, and they've sort of renamed it to a more logical sense. So there's the, a quick overview of the difference between files, folders, directories, and libraries. It has a great impact on doing file backups and library backups in subsequent chapters coming up. Let's talk about BIOS and UEFI for a second. Older computers, possibly made 10 years ago or so, even, even as far as seven years ago, um, had a, a traditional uh, component inside of it called a BIOS, which was an acronym for Basic In-Out System, Input-Output System. And this was the firmware. We refer to this as the firmware of the machine. And it was where you would go to make adjustments to uh, characteristics of the machine. This is before the computer uh, boots its operating system. They were very simple and getting the, into them is, a, is always a bit of a challenge because there was no standard for how to get into the BIOS. We'll see that later. Um, there, over the years there have been attempts to change it and uh, now a modern computer made probably also in the last uh, say 10 years possibly less. Um, it, there's more standards and improvements in something called the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, um, or EFI, as some people call it. And it, uh, it not only does it look better, it, it actually offers a lot of 
big improvements over the traditional BIOS. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is um, your computer may have a, a, a you may have an older computer that has a traditional BIOS, or you may have a modern computer that has a UEFI or a combination of each. There are types of computers where you can disable some of the features of UEFI and go back to a legacy style of BIOS. The reason why I'm saying this is it has implications on the partition structure. On this uh, system, I've I've included. You have the ability to see up here. This is a Windows 7 64 BIOS style of computer, and I created this partition prior to Windows installing. On this system, I just have uh, system boot page. Da -da -da. You may see this if you're more of a geek, but most people would not see this because you you just let Windows do what it needs to do when it installs. You probably see a machine more like this. This is a Windows 8 64 BIOS base, but this could look identical to a Windows 7 machine or even a Windows 10 BIOS system on this system. Um, because it, I let Windows do the installation, it went ahead and formatted the drive as it would want. It actually uh, created a system reserved partition where the system active and primary are up here. These, this, this partition is actually hidden from view. You, you don't normally see this partition. And then my operating system drive is here. This is a BIOS system. This is what you may see if you went ahead and installed your operating system on a brand new drive or, or got it from the factory like this. Now here is an example of a Windows 7 64 UEFI style of machine. And you can't see at first that it is an EFI machine, uh, except for the fact that there is a uh, system partition that has the label EFI. And uh, so that's, that's one way of identifying a, an EFI system. If you didn't know, uh, a Windows 8 64 bit uh, looks a little differently. Uh, this particular one has a 300 meg recovery partition up in the front, a, uh, an, another EFI system partition tucked in the middle here, and then the operating system way over here on the end. Let's have a look at a Windows 10 uh, EFI. Uh, this one, for example, is also similar to the Windows 8. It has uh, a little bit bigger of a uh, recovery partition, a 99 megabyte EFI partition, and then the rest of the operating system. Um, and this is not the only way I've seen these systems. Uh, I've got some computers that have come from OEMs. Uh, let's say uh, a company like Asus or Lenovo will uh, choose to partition it in any way they want. And I've seen systems where the recovery partition is at the end and it's bigger and it's smaller. So your partitioning scheme is kind of uh, all over the map, depending on whether or not you have a, a BIOS-based system, a UEFI-based system, whether you did the fresh install, whether the partition existed in advance, whether it comes from a manufacturer. It can be a bit of a nightmare. Fortunately for us, um, Windows is smart enough to know that when it's doing backups, it knows not only is the critical operating system files got to be backed up, also these two other partitions are going to automatically be picked during the, par the backup creation and backup restoration. So you do not need to worry about that situation. But I thought it would be helpful to identify partitions and disks in a more verbose method for you. One last little piece of housekeeping prior to getting into it is um, the concept of the difference between file backups and system image. Um, with Windows 7, this is just a quick intro to what the Windows 7 backup interface looks like. It gives you the option to do both. So here I will show you this in more detail later, but with Windows 7, I could choose to specify backing up individual files and libraries, specific files and folders um, on the hard drive. And optionally, I can choose to include a system image so that the, the computer itself can be recovered from, from some kind of a disk failure. And I could uncheck these, for example, and just include the system image. Or I can check these and uncheck the system image. So I have several variations of 
both file and or system image. Now with Windows 10, it gets a little confusing. Windows 10 included the ability of utilizing the same tool I just showed you. The backup, the Windows 7 backup and restore utility is included in Windows 10. Okay, so we'll be using that. The familiarization of learning that in Windows 7 in these videos is going to help us with that. But Microsoft added a second independent backup feature called file history. And that is important to learn and understand because it acts independently of the system images. And it's quite helpful actually if you've got a functioning computer and you just want to do quick file backups and quick file restorations with a working computer. It could actually offer you a little bit quicker of a backup routine than a full system backup. So there are differences between the two. There's a bit of overlap between the two. I just wanted to get that out of the way before we go too far down the rabbit hole. Okay, so let's begin with the configuration of our backups. We'll first start with Windows 7 on this, uh, on, on this tutorial here. So we have a copy of Windows 7 Professional, uh, a 64-bit version of that. Um, that operating system. I need to do a start and run, go for backup and restore. That's one way of getting here. You can also get there using the control panel to backup and restore. Now the first thing we need to do is set up our backup. I'll click that once and it'll give us an opportunity to pick our backup drive which is hopefully connected now. You could connect it at this time and, and refresh if necessary so that drive shows up for you. You can also save externally onto a network if you had a NAS configured or some kind of a share configured up. You, If you had the appropriate permissions you can browse for that network uh, device right now and start configuring it to save it to that location. We're going to do a local disk for now. Now you have two choices. Windows will automatically go with some pre-configured choices or you can choose. I recommend doing a choice. Now the first option is uh, to ensure that newly created users have their data backed up. That would be a good idea if you haven't yet created all the users on your system and you intend on having their data included in the backups you're configuring right now. Now, my libraries are very important, so my documents, my music, my pictures, my videos are all going to be included in this backup. If you have a different backup strategy and you don't want to include large quantities of pictures and videos, you may want to uncheck these now. Uh, there's also a location, uh, additional locations set here, which is pretty wise. You might want to carefully look at whether or not you want to include your desktop and your downloads. Uh, sometimes people forget to clean up their desktop and they have uh, gigabytes of files stored there that are important but maybe a little bit old and stale and uh, perhaps they should be cleaned or eliminated or just not part of the backup. And the same thing with downloads. People tend to download lots and lots and lots of files but they don't really clean them up. And if, they, if, if tens of gigabytes are in your downloads directory, well that's going to be part of your backups unless you do something like this. So you really should consider that. Now there's also a choice here for specifying specific directories that are something that you may need to have, some individual directories or individual folders to, uh, to specify included in your backup. There are none checked by default here. And then lastly, the most important part of this backup is to include a system image of the operating system drive, the C drive in this case. And this will, not only will this back up all this stuff up here, your backups will include an image of your operating system in case there's any kind of damage or virus infection, even a broken hard drive, you'll be able to restore your operating system as well as your files in one step, which we will cover in this, in this video series. I'm going to leave that checked off by default 
And now um, the, we do have a chance here to change a schedule. What kind of schedule do you want? Do you want a weekly schedule, daily or monthly? Daily is probably a good idea. And then what time? Let's leave it at seven. Now we're going to save the settings and run this backup. You'll notice up here in a few moments the backup will start and probably take a little while on this machine. There's a fair bit of data that has to be transferred. I'll come back and show you what this looks like in a minute. Now that the backup's done, let's have a look at what it looks like from the disk's perspective. I'm going to double click on it and I'll see the name of the computer is right here with a special icon. If I double click on this, I have three options. Restoring files that are unique to you, they're called my files. Then there's restoring files for all users of this particular computer, if you had more than one user. And then managing space used by this backup. You'll also see these same options, restore my files and restore all users in the backup and restore area. Let's try first just restoring a single file for myself. Here, up here at the top, the default is to restore the latest version. I've done this a couple of times now. I could, in fact, go back to an earlier date and, if necessary, browse way back for other backups to find a specific file for a date that you're interested in. I'll just use the current date right now. I could go for simply looking for a single file or for a folder. I'm going to go for a file. This is a backup of my C drive in the users directory. I'm looking for myself and I'm going to go for a file. Let's say it's in the documents directory, a master cleanse recipe. And then I'm going to simply say highlight the file and then next. And then it gives me a chance to restore the file in the original location, overwriting possibly the old file, giving me a chance to do something about overwriting. Or I can specify a different destination directory, which is kind of interesting. I'll say restore just to see, show you that, in fact, the original file is there. And I can copy and replace or do other kinds of things with the conflicts if necessary. So that's how to restore a single file. If I wanted to, I could also restore all users' files. The interface looks identical, but you'll see up here it's, it, it has the word advanced. If we did it originally, there is no advanced. You'll see how this looks different. If I go to the users, I have only public and Steve. If I go to all files, browse for files, there's a new user that I created and did backups for called Bob. Bob has specific files that I can see now because I chose the all users field. All, all users restoration tool will get all users on the machine, whereas this button here will only get your files as, as to the person who's currently logged on and doing this restoration. It's very important in case you run into problems with uh, individual files or individual users. So we've gone through the restoration of my files and restoration of all files, but we haven't looked yet at managed space used by this backup, which is also coincidentally also right here in managed space. You can get an idea of the quantity of data that's taken up on the hard drive, um, both from the perspective of the system image, as well as the individual files occupied by users on your system. It may be necessary to come here once in a while and simply specify previous backups that you may want to delete in case you're running out of space. And you may also have to come through and free up disk space by adjusting the Windows retention of older system images 
and you can let Windows try to manage that manually. In this situation, it's going to keep a maximum of 29, 12, 30 gigabytes of backup history, or you can ask it to keep only the latest system image. That's something you may need to consider if you're low on disk space for uh, for the backup duration and how much time you have. So it's a good idea to keep on an eye on this. Make sure your backups are occurring um, with with respect to your schedule. Make sure they're happening, and also make sure it's not getting too out of control, and that you're ensuring that there is adequate amount of space for future backups. As you learned in previous chapters, um, it may be necessary to recover your computer using a system image in situations where the disk is not bootable. And that would utilize the use of a system repair disk. It's a good idea to prepare a system repair disk proactively from a working system or a, a different computer if necessary. That is done using the create a system repair disk button up here. Now this particular utility only writes to physical CD-ROM media and um, some systems may not have a, uh, an existing CD writer or DVD writer or perhaps yours is broken. Um, it may be necessary to go out and purchase yourself an external modern USB connected DVD writer which is compatible with creating old CD-ROMs um, in that situation and it's helpful to have these around for the odd situation where you do need to read a DVD or a CD. Once that process is done you will actually have a physical disk that you can label um, write down perhaps the label that's included with the process called Repair Disk Windows 7 64-bit, which occupies only about 175 megabytes, and it looks like that. So that's how you create the physical media with an existing functioning CD burner on your system. A more modern way of maintaining your computer um, from emergency repair disks is to use a USB stick. Um, there are two steps to this process. Assuming that you have your re physical repair disk media, you need to create what's called an ISO using some tools to retrieve the Im image information from the CD and store it in ISO format. There are several tools um, out there floating around. A very classic old tool called the LC ISO Creator. There's another tool called the Infra Recorder and a, a tool, very popular tool called the CDRT front end, CDR Tools front end. The LC ISO Creator is unbelievably tiny at 52 kilobytes and it simply is executed and it'll automatically see your repair disk and give you a chance to create your ISO with, with, with a single click. We can just give it a name like 7 here and let it go. It's not usually this fast, it's this super fast here because of the, the presence of virtualization on this computer. Um, however, the end result is an ISO file, which is an exact image of the CD-ROM, which is very helpful. Now, if you were not in a situation where you could burn um, a CD-ROM in order to create an ISO, uh, in some situations, I have no problems with making a download available of an actual ISO file for you manually. In a case like this, you could be manually downloading a Windows 7 repair ISO directly to your computer. Now you've got the ISO creation part done. Now we have to go through the process of creating a USB boot drive using this ISO file.
Your Windows 7 computer might come with uh, two different types of firmware. Uh, your computer might have a BIOS style of firmware, or it might has, have a UEFI, UEFI style of firmware. And the rescue media that gets created from those two different firmware type computers is actually different. So uh, you have to pay attention to which firmware you have and, or which media you have. It's kind of hard to tell if you turn on your computer and you you may have a chance to get into the BIOS. We'll get into that in further chapters, but it's a little tricky these days to get into the BIOS if you've never been there before. A simple way of seeing if you have a BIOS-based computer is just to have a quick peek uh, at your disk using the the disk management utility. Uh, you may have a single partition like this, two partitions, um, and you have no mention of the word EFI here. So this is a single BIOS style partition where the operating system takes up the entire uh, disk. This computer here is a UEFI firmware style and it has the mention of a uh, EFI system partition. So this in fact is a EFI style firmware. So if you see the presence of EFI anywhere in your primary disk where the operating system lives, uh, you definitely have, uh, well, I'm pretty sure you have a UEFI firmware. Why I'm talking about this is because if you create rescue media using the techniques uh, in this video, depending upon what type of firmware you have, you will get different um, uh, rescue media. The slight difference in size is noted here. This is a rescue media for a BIOS. This is a rescue media that's created from an UEFI firmware. So they are slightly different in size. And if you have a look with 7-Zip at the actual contents, I just simply right-clicked on the rescue media here with 7-Zip. The BIOS.ISO just has sources, boot, and boot manager. Whereas the rescue UEFI uh, ISO actually has the mention of EFI again and bootmanager.efi. So there is a distinct difference between the two different rescue medias. If you are building one, you don't have to worry so much about this. Just label it appropriately so you know which type it is. And if you're downloading one for your computer, it's important to understand which one you need for the type of computer that you have. On the next chapter, let's go through the process of converting this ISO into a bootable USB stick. Okay, so we have our rescue media prepared, whether or not it's a BIOS firmware or UEFI firmware. We've, we've made it, downloaded it, or created it. The files are sitting on our desktop or somewhere accessible. The next thing we need to get is a tool. Uh, I like to use a tool called Rufus. It's free, it's very powerful, and it'll take care of a lot of the difficult choices automatically. It's pretty, a uh, pretty nice little th package. It also runs out of its own directory and it's fairly small. So I've downloaded it here and uh, the main executable is all you need to run. We'll do that now. And uh, oh, I also have to prepare a USB key, obviously. I have a 16 gig disk inside my system. I actually, a 16 gig USB key, I actually just for the fun of it, I went ahead and formatted it and I gave it a label name of blank. You don't necessarily have to do this, but it might help you avoid getting lost as to which disk you're picking or which uh, key you're picking when at the time of use. So I'll wait for this format to finish and I'll close it out. So as you can see, it's attached to the computer, it's blank. It's going to be wiped out, so if you have a key you want to use with other data still on it, you may want to get that data off first. Uh, Rufus will not accidentally pick any critical uh, disk like your hard drive, so do not worry about it. The default settings are sane. If you start playing with settings like list hard drives, then you risk the chance of nuking your hard drive. So just stay away from uh, any of the default settings that are down there. The uh, USB key is automatically picked in my situation. The next most important thing is actually choose the type of ISO that you want to burn or write to your 
key. If I pick the rescue media from a BIOS style firmware, it automatically uh, selects here what's called MBR and the target system is BIOS. The uh, repair disk label is automatically made, the file system and the cluster size, everything is taken care of automatically. You do not need to change anything. You just simply hit start and the files will be written out to the key and, and that'll be awesome. Now, if you also had a other style, a UEFI style of firmware, picking that, you'll see that Rufus has automatically picked up that it's going to use a GPT style of uh, partition scheme. The target system is UEFI, which you know, and it actually formats it differently, which is kind of interesting. So first pick the correct type of ISO for the machine you're intending on burning. If you want to do both, just have two different keys, that's no big deal. And then we're just going to sit, uh, click on the start button. I'm going to build a UEFI key just for this one. I'm going to hit OK. And it will delete and format the disk, or the USB key, I should say, out, um, writing all the data to it. And when it's done, it will uh, say ready down here. I'll just uh, pause this video until it's ready and continue. Okay, so the USB key is now created. It only took a minute and 12 seconds on this system, which is pretty pretty fast. Uh, Rufus has this ready status. You can click close, and uh, we can actually have a take advantage of that and have a look at uh, what's on the disk, what's on the USB key, I should say. It looks uh, looks pretty normal, but uh, without testing it, you don't know if this is functioning. And I do find that sometimes I have to do a key a couple of times in order to get it to work 100%. Formatting is necessary sometimes to do it again. So make sure you test your key. It's pretty useless if you need this in a pinch and you didn't test it out. So in the next chapter, we'll talk about how to boot your system uh, and access the USB key and test it out. Now in order to boot your computer with a USB key or a CD-ROM, you may need to adjust something called the, uh, or, or hit a certain boot key, boot menu key at the time of turning on your computer. Um, and unfortunately there is no standard for which key to hit. Um, when you do turn your computer on, you may see a very quick flashing of um, some options for you to select uh, the boot menu, but quite often it's so fast you don't have time to hit it. It might be in your user documentation on which key to hit. And uh, here's a, an example of uh, a quick Google search of some particular boot menu keys that can be hit for certain laptops and desktop computers out there. Um, it's not an exhaustive list. You may want to refer to your documentation for your manual. Now, uh, you could permanently assign your USB key or CD-ROM um, in, um, in preference over top of booting your hard disk first. There is a particular boot order that you can specify in something called your BIOS or your BIOS. Getting into your BIOS is yet another uh, key stroke that's necessary at boot time. You have to reference your uh, user documentation for that as well. Uh, but when, when done correctly, the BIOS, um, old school BIOSes look like uh, th these sort of images. That's an actual BIOS chip that's on a board. Here's another BIOS from a particular type of computer. Um, now your modern computer might have a, a newer, more updated version of the, the BIOS environment called the UEFI. Um, it's a lot more fancy, a lot more feature rich. And uh, here's a comparison of an old traditional BIOS and a, a more modern system. Now, um, it getting into the BIOS uh, is pretty easy in this environment here. I'm going to ensure that this machine is going to power on into what's called firmware. I'm hitting that uh, button right now. And this computer, this virtual computer, will boot up into what's called a virtual BIOS, just to give you an idea of what we're dealing with. Somewhere in your BIOS, 
there will be a section to adjust the boot order. As you can see, um, removable devices is at the top. That would be like traditional floppies or any kind of removable disk that's supported. The CD-ROM drive is currently above the, the hard drive. Um, normally the hard drive would probably be at the, the top of the list. So I don't have to make any adjustments. I normally do. I can use the plus and the minus key on the keyboard to move um, the devices around. Just for the fun of it, I'll put the CD-ROM at the very top. If you needed to, you could adjust um, the boot order with, res with respect to your USB key. Uh, you can simply put the USB key at the top or just make sure that the USB key is above the hard drive because that is the order. The hard drive being your operating system drive is is going to be taking preference if you're if it's above your USB key. I hope that helps. So what we're going to do now is exit and save the changes and now it, with luck it's going to try to boot from my repair disk and my repair disk will require me to hit a key. Did you see that? It said uh, press any key to boot from CD or DVD and it is necessary to do that in order to get the key to boot otherwise it will skip that particular uh, boot option and move on to the next. Before we go down the path of restoring to a disk, it's important to understand the disk number from the perspective of the computer. If I right click on my computer icon, and you ch select manage and go to disk management, you'll see here that there is the disk number on the left side of this window here and your operating system drive, OS drive or C drive, is disk zero. There is a different disk number for the backup drive. It's a completely different disk. But it's important to understand that disk zero is the first disk on the system. This is a digital world and in the digital world zero is a, an actual entity. So disk one is not the first disk in the system. Disk one is the second disk in the system. That's going to be very important in situations where you're choosing to write to a certain disk number in an environment where you don't see a, a graphical interface like this. We'll see that in a second when we try to restore our system image back to the hard drive. Let's say that you're in a situation where the operating system drive is damaged, not functioning very well, possibly infested with viruses or just running in some kind of strange situation and you want to use the system restore to go back to a, a previous image that you've made. I'll do that in this situation. Here I have booted up from our restore uh, image and the very first question is to select the language, which is uh, in this case US. And I'm going to let it search for Windows installations. And it, it has found my existing operating system drive, but I'm going to not use any tools here on that. I'm going to restore my computer, this option here, using a system image that I created earlier. And then I'm going to, this is the latest system image that was made. You may want to specify a particular system image. Here is uh, the backup location of many system images in my situation. If I click next, I have a whole bunch of them that I've made over time. Um, we're going to still continue to click and ch uh, select the most recent system image. Then I'm going to hit next. And now you have a choice to either uh, leave the, the system intact and it'll overwrite any files that um, um, are in place and it'll 
uh, try to correct any kind of errors. However, I'm more of a fan of actually formatting and repartitioning the drive and just sort of starting from scratch from the backup that you've made. Now you may need to specify this option here for excluding disks and this is where the disk number comes in from what we talked about earlier. This is here is asking you to select disks to exclude from the restore process. These disks will not be formatted or repartitioned. So this disk here, disk zero, that's your operating system disk. Notice how it's not checked. This obviously will be formatted. That's absolutely imperative. However, down here it says disk one, if you remember that's our disk where our backups live, it's already excluded as if this is where this is what contains the system image to be restored. So everything looks good. I don't have to play with any settings here. I'm just going to click on next. Again, it's going to validate which image it's going to grab. And then one last warning, all disks to be restored will be formatted and replaced with the layout and data in the system image. Are you sure? Yes. We'll come back to this in a moment when it's done. Looks like it's gotten pretty close to done. We'll just walk you through the last parts here from doing cleanup. Yay! The restore was completed successfully and it's giving us an option to restart now or don't restart. Um, and that was a setting we didn't select before. We could have picked don't restart. You may want to do some kind of post restoration uh, adjustments to the system, but we don't need to. We could have just let it go and restart automatically. Let's click restart and cross our fingers that the operating system comes up. There's our boot prompt, which we will not select. We will not hit any key. And here comes the Windows operating system booting up from restoration. Let's make sure it logs on automatically. And that looks great. You'll notice that there's some stuff that was on the desktop prior. I didn't make a backup of the state of that machine at the time. But uh, this would be the operating system and all the files that you included at the time of doing the backups functioning as you would expect. On the next one, let's try to do a restoration on a system that has uh, its hard disk actually destroyed. The actual um, Im image information is completely gone. It looks a slightly bit different. Okay, on this system, I have intentionally destroyed any data that's on the C drive. So it's empty right now. I'm simulating the booting up of the computer with the restore disk and I have my backup disk attached to the to, to the computer. So when I click next on selecting the language, you'll probably see that there is no uh, it automatically actually went to this setting here. There, there was no automatic selecting of uh, using recovery tools and it didn't try to find and did not find an existing operating system, which makes sense. There is no existing operating system. I'm going to click next here. And again, I'm going to pick a system image manually from this backup environment. I'm going to pick this backup once again. And this time I'm just going to show you, oh, I should mention that format and repartition disks is automatically checked off here. It has to be done. It, it can't be avoided in this situation um, because the existing partition scheme doesn't even exist on the, um, on the operating system drive. The exclude disks still makes sense. Disk zero has to be formatted. Disk one is excluded as that's where our image is. Um, and there is an option here we could have picked earlier, which is 
do you want to automatically restart this computer after restore is complete? The default sane. And then do you want to automatically check and update disk error information? Yes. So the restoration process is pretty similar with this environment. Um, I'm going to say yes to continue. Now this situation could easily have been a, a, a disk whose whose data just disappeared um, or it could be a, a bad situation with respect to um, a partition going away or there's no reason why you couldn't switch out your hard drive your original operating system hard drive could have been replaced with a solid state drive or a, or a different disk and this is the same situation that you would be facing uh, you'd be restoring to a disk that doesn't have any data on it and the process would be identical let's come back to this in a second after this restoration is done Okay, if the demo gods are kind to us, we'll see cleaning here in a second. Interesting, we don't see any mention of cleaning on this one. Successful restoration, and then an automatic restart prompt when in one minute. I'll hit restart now. I'm not going to hit any key to boot from my emergency media. Now Windows is booting, which is great. We'll wait for that to log on automatically. And there you go. So there's a restoration process on a on a blank disk, empty disk, or a brand new disk. Pretty cool. On the next one, we're going to try something even more fun. There's another, there is another restoration method I've discovered um, in playing around with the backup and restore. Assuming that your system is running correctly, you'll find it under recover system settings or your computer under advanced recovery methods and here it is use a system image you were created earlier to recover your computer i'm going to click that it'll give us a chance to back up our files at this time if you've already done a backup of your individual individual files you can skip that or do a backup now i'm going to skip it assuming you've done your your backups already and then restart is going to warn us restarting your computer and continuing the recovery if you are restoring your computer from a system backup you will be, a be able to select your backup date if more than one exists and we have chosen not to back up your data it's saying we might lose files but we're okay because we already have backups of those files in our previously made backups. So don't concern yourself with that. I'm going to click restart and I'm not going to pick the booting of our restore media. I'm just going to let Windows try to boot on its own. And you'll notice that the boot process is a little bit different because that is why it, it is booting from a uh, a recovery media that that was temporarily set up this is not the emergency CD media and this is not the emergency USB media this is a temporary boot up environment from a working computer from here I'm going to pick next let's choose a system image You'll notice I cannot select, format, and repartition the disks. I'm going to click Next. It's giving us a, a warning about if the restore process fails or is interrupted, it's going to have a hard time. If it does happen, you can use a system repair disk to try to restore the computer or attempt other system recovery options and an option to create a system repair disk, which we don't need to do. We already have ours. I'm going to click finish and then a uh, last warning all the data on the drives to be restored will be replaced with the data in the system image 
Are you sure you want to continue? Yes. So this option here is helpful if you want to restore simply without the need to find your emergency repair uh, media. And you just want to simply do it from a functioning computer. Let's see what that looks like when this is done. Okay, we're just coming to the conclusion of the disk restore. Let's let it restart. I will not select booting from the emergency media. Log on is automatic. And at the conclusion of the um, restoration, it knows where it started and it gives you the option to restore user files if necessary. Um, since your backup already had your user files, you can cancel on this. It's not necessary to manually do any restoration of independent files. So there's an another way of restoring in this situation without needing the advanced options of your recovery media. Pretty helpful. You may have Windows 7 or 8 or 10 and um, it's running great and you wanted to prepare emergency media and you needed to get access to the media. Um, it's unfortunately not possible to use the media for different operating systems um, or different architectures. So if you have a Windows 7 machine, you must use Windows 7 media. Same for 8 and 10. You cannot use Windows 10 media to recover a Windows 7 machine. Also, um, you may have a particular type of architecture. In this case, if I was to go and download the media for Windows 8.1, I'll see that there are two different types of architectures, a 64-bit architecture and a 32-bit architecture. The bit size is just how big um, the digital words are that the computer speaks. A 64-bit computer is much more modern. Uh, you, you may have an older computer that's running a 32-bit version of Windows and you cannot use the 32-bit version of Windows to uh, maintain the 64-bit version of, of Windows. You cannot use the media of, of either of these uh, going in either direction. To demonstrate that, I've got a 64-bit machine here that's already built and I'm going to modify the machine to point it to the media for the 32-bit Windows 7. So here we go. This is the 32-bit Windows 7 media. And I'm going to turn on this machine. So in a, this is a simu, oops, I have to the space bar here. Oh, I hope I didn't miss it. I think. I might have missed it, so I'm just going to restart this VM just in case. And I'll be ready this time. There we go. So here's a, a test of trying to maintain Windows 764 bit machine with a Windows, um, with a 32 bit version of the operating system. So I'm booting that machine up. I'm sorry, I'm booting that machine up with that media. Which is fairly slow. And I'm going to click next, then repair my computer. And I can get pretty far. You think it'll work. There are other parts of this um, media that you can use. Let's try to restore a computer, restore the computer using a system image 
we were created earlier. We've seen this several times. You think you're going to work. And then you get the error. The selected system image cannot be restored in this environment. And it even tells us that we need to insert a system repair disk or a win Windows installation disk. That's x64. That's the 64-bit version. So ensure that you have the correct version of the type of operating system and the architecture um, of your operating system for your media. Very, very important.